This is Questions of Courage, a podcast from the youth section of the School for Spiritual Science. Welcome to Questions of Courage. Today I'd like to take the opportunity to reflect on a remarkable article that was written some years ago by Michelle Alexander. She's a civil rights lawyer and scholar, and she was author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And this opinion piece that appeared in the New York Times, you can find a link in the show notes for it, um, was called, What If We're All Coming Back? And in the beginning, she introduces the picture of a young girl, black girl in the United States, walking down a street, and from a distance, she sees an older white man And she can't make out necessarily who this is, but she she has a spontaneous feeling as if she's meeting a long lost friend or lover. And with that kind of excitement, she runs towards this person. And interestingly enough, he runs towards her as well. And when they reach one another in the middle of the street and they can see each other, she mumbles, I'm sorry, I, I I thought I knew you and is suddenly ashamed, doesn't understand what's happening. And likewise, he responds by saying, this is so strange, what's going on right now? And they go their separate ways in this kind of feeling of mystery, and they don't see each other again. And this is an experience that Michelle Alexander uh, relates that she had when she was young, and that opened up a whole area of questions for her about the possibility of reincarnation and karma. And she shares right off the bat that she is not a person that believes in reincarnation and karma, even though she did earlier in her life have an openness and an interest in trying to think about the possibility and whether or not it was a reality. And she does point out, however, that according to a poll, 33% of Americans believe in reincarnation and karma, and 29% of Christians, but she doesn't count herself among those. She goes on to share about her studies as a young person and how she came into contact with the work of John Rawls, a political theorist who, those of you who are studying uh, political science or political philosophy will be familiar with, for his famous work, A Theory of Justice. And it's not surprising that she brings this book up because one of the central um, strategies that Rawls as a philosopher employs in trying to come to an idea of what justice is is a thought experiment that involves imagining that you are going to be born on the earth and you don't know where you're going to be born or in what circumstances and that you draw a kind of veil of ignorance over the life that you're going to be living and the social status and cultural and economic status you're going to be born into. And from this perspective, to try to come up with maxims and ideas about constitutional order of justice for society. Rawls develops this idea in a remarkable way and comes up with something that he refers to as the difference principle, which is that inequality can only be understood as just insofar as it benefits the greater whole and alleviates a greater inequality. It is interesting in reading this uh, opinion piece to notice just how naturally the question of reincarnation and karma comes up for Michelle Alexander as a young person according to her own description and how she wonders about the possibility that what appears to be chance, what appears to be just probability and coincidence 
actually might have some deeper meaning, some deeper moral um, component to it, namely destiny and um, the biographies of human beings. And when she goes into college, she isn't able to come to a way of thinking about this that she's satisfied with, but through political science, she's able to find a way to connect with the concepts of justice through the work of John Rawls. And she closes this opinion piece by saying, quote, Rawls was right. True morality becomes possible only when we step outside the box of our perceived self-interest and care for others as much as we care for ourselves. But rather than imagining a scenario in which we're entirely ignorant of what the future holds, perhaps we ought to imagine that we personally will be born again into the world that we are creating today through our collective and individual choices. So even though um, she admits that she doesn't believe in reincarnation and karma, she suggests at the end that maybe we'd all be better off by living with this as a thought experiment and by suggesting that it would really shift the way we looked at the organization of society, our social life, economic life, social and economic justice. And it's clear that it is much easier to speak, for instance, about these things in the way that John Rawls does and Michelle Alexander, using reincarnation and karma as a thought experiment. But it's also clear that a thought experiment only carries so much gravity for us and to imagine or hypothesize that reincarnation and karma exists, but not really to take it seriously in the depths of our being or to be able to take it seriously or think about it in a realistic way means that this thought experiment ultimately is pretty limited in its efficacy and the way that it can influence us. One of the major focuses and strivings within the anthroposophical movement for over a hundred years now has been an attempt to approach the possibility of reincarnation and karma as a reality, not only through thinking and philosophy and thought experiments, but also through meditative research techniques or contemplative research techniques. And those naturally will get a lot of attention right off the bat. Such a bold claim that such a thing could be possible. But what we might underestimate is how important it can be to even think in simple ways about the possible reality of reincarnation and karma and how we have to challenge in ourselves certain habits of thought, certain ways of thinking, and just to open our minds to the possibility. And I'd like to focus on these, just introduce a couple of these um, thought transformations or openings, ways of thinking where we could realistically open our minds to even consider the reality of reincarnation and karma and not focus on the research practices that have been suggested as a path to come to know specifics about reincarnation and karma that also make up a part of the striving of the School for Spiritual Science that has its center at the Goethe Anum and within the Anthroposophical Movement. The thoughts I'd like to share with you come from one of Rudolf Steiner's early works in this area called Theosophy, an introduction. And this book, there's one chapter that is focused on reincarnation and karma. And it's remarkable because Rudolf Steiner doesn't focus on the possibility of 
finding ways to perceive past incarnations of individuals or to speculate about them. But instead, he tries to find ways of thinking that can make us even open to the plausibility of reincarnation and karma. And one of the remarkable areas that he does this is by thinking about memory. Memory is one of those great wonders that we are constantly living in, in normal consciousness, and undervaluing or taking for granted of course, until we begin to have memory problems, perhaps in life or in old age. But we all are so familiar with it, in it being so intimately connected with what our experience is made out of. We have an experience, we meet someone, and we go our separate ways, and a couple weeks later, we see them again. And when we see them again, spontaneously, through the power of memory, the encounter that we had with them and what we shared with them from before comes back to life within us. And this kind of expanding of our horizon through time that memory brings about kind of brings us back to ourselves in a way, brings us back to that part of ourselves that also was living through that previous encounter or conversation or experience that we had with that person. And so in a way, one way to characterize memory is it is something that we experience that then comes back to us when we encounter it again through the outside. It's as if there is a part of us that can be reawoken in relationship with the world around us and our continuing lives. And when we don't have memory or we have memory problems, there is an extreme change in our ability to live in this way with this kind of an experience of who we are in ourselves and our lives. Now Rudolf Steiner suggests that we think about our actions in a way that is very unconventional. If, for instance, we observe the simple fact that if we walk through the forest and break a limb while we're going down a path, that in the future, that part of the forest is going to unfold differently because of the fact that we broke that limb. Now, typically, I'd like to suggest, and of course, coming from my own context as a, someone who came of age in the United States, that one would look at this as absolutely unconnected to the future of the person that broke the branch. Um, sure, it has an effect, but it's not in any way strongly connected to what that person is going to experience through in the future, they may have no experience of the ramifications or the effects of breaking that branch. Rudolf Steiner suggests to entertain the idea that any action that we engage in, say for instance, the breaking of this branch, that it is a part of who we are, an invisible part of who we are, and that just like memory has a possibility to return to ourselves given the right outer circumstances. For instance, we meet someone again and then a memory can return to ourselves through that encounter. So too, um, it's possible to imagine that all of our actions that are active in the world around us, that we are unconscious of, are not really separated from ourselves in reality, but that have a kind of belonging that are connected to us through invisible threads and that in a way will return to us in some form in the future. Through this way of just considering the possibility that our actions that are active in their effects all over the world 
actually are part of an expanded self that has a tendency to return to ourselves, he introduces the idea of self-created destiny or karma. And he suggests that we consider that when an event or um, an experience, perhaps also a very diff difficult experience in our own lives comes towards us, that one way that it would change how we look at these experiences is that we would experience that these events in life are bringing us a part of ourselves, that we are in a way coming to ourselves in a similar way that memory brings us a part of ourselves from the past, so too our destiny or our biography brings us a part of ourselves and something can light up in us that belongs to us. And this is interesting to consider in the light of an experience like the one that Michelle Alexander mentions in the beginning of this opinion piece that she wrote some years ago, namely that she encountered a person that she didn't know, and yet she had a feeling that something that intimately belonged to her was connected with this encounter. Something woke up in her that puzzled her, that was a mystery to her, and yet that came out of herself through an encounter, through meeting another person, and that it opened up something that felt intimately connected with who she was. And when we look back in our own lives and we look at both positive and challenging relationships or experiences, it is a question that we can live with. Does this resonate? Does this actually open up a possibility of looking at the human network or web of relationships that make us who we are? in a way that we could be open-minded to the reality of reincarnation and karma. There's another um, thought that Rudolf Steiner develops that is related to the development of capacities that he suggests can facilitate our just opening our minds to the possibility of considering reincarnation and karma not merely as an intellectual speculative thought experiment but even on a deeper level but to open ourselves to its possibility in reality and this has to do with the capacities that we and other people come into life with that usually you would spend time having to develop and to learn through either going through many difficult experiences yourself or through practicing and developing yourself on a path of self-education. And of course, there are remarkable instances of geniuses. I think Mozart is probably one of the most um, commonly described in this regard. Someone who comes into life with abilities that are simply miraculous and that cannot be gotten from adding together the genetic or inherited qualities of the parents. And capacities which, even if some of us worked our whole lives to try to develop them, might not be able to develop them through persistent practice. And yet, we are all born with certain capacities, maybe not in the extreme degree that we see them in a genius like Mozart, but we are all born with certain capacities that we don't have to work for in the same way that we have to work for other capacities. And Rudolf Steiner suggests that this also is something that we can take inwardly and live with as a way to open up our thinking to consider the possibility of reincarnation and karma. Now, coming back to uh, Michelle Alexander's opinion piece and the reason that she wrote it, um, you know, she describes this path in her biography as a young person naturally coming up with these questions about reincarnation and karma. 
And then as she pursued her education, leaving them behind and embracing uh, a kind of another view that uses it maybe as a thought experiment, but doesn't take it truly seriously. But she does pose a question, what would it mean for our social order and for our own participation as individuals in society at large if we took reincarnation and karma seriously. Without coming to conclusions about that, I hope to leave it today in this episode as a living question. Um, If we think about the actions that we commit possibly returning to us and we live with this imagination that it's possible to think of our own biographies and experiences in life as in a way bringing us back to ourselves in an analog or an analogous way in certain respects to what we experience with memory and to see the capacities that people bring with them that are not really explainable um, through their age or experience or even their heritage also as the mysteries that they are that we can open up a serious field of inquiry related to reincarnation and karma. And the further question that Michelle Alexander herself poses, what could this mean if this is true? If this is true, what would it mean for our social action, our social forms, for the way that we looked at our political policies, our economic enterprises, our educational, artistic, and cultural projects, what would it mean? And of course, that's something I'm not going to be able to speak to today, but I hope that in these thoughts, it is possible to take the thought experiment that Michelle Alexander herself kind of poses and maybe keep it open in a way that she doesn't, that reincarnation and karma may be something that could have a reality and be a real part of the human being. There are some references in the show notes for some of you who might to look more deeply into this For instance, Rudolf Steiner's Theosophy, which I mentioned earlier. Questions of Courage is a collaboration between the youth section, Goethe Annam Weekly, Goethe Annam TV, and the production costs are very low, and we invite you to contribute to the youth, the global, the Youth Access and Project Fund, or the Global Youth Section Fund, which will support youth work in the youth groups and youth network around the world. Thank you very much.